Welcome to our third episode of In The Real. Today, we're going to take a deeper look at the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. So I want to start by talking about jargon. Jargon meaning it's a vocabulary that belongs to a certain practice. So medical students learn something around 4,000 new words a year. And I'm thinking lawyers pretty much learn a whole lot of new vocabulary as well. I bring this up because as you're reading Graham Turner's Film is Social Practice 4, you're going to come across a lot of concepts and words that you're not familiar with. I would call this text dense light because a lot of upper level college texts are extremely dense and Turner does a great job preparing you with some of that language so that your life will be easier as you move into more challenging courses. The reason why I want to talk about jargon with the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is because of the way critics and scholars have treated the film. A lot of times when a great world trauma has occurred, historians want to go in and figure out like what are the things that led up to something like the Holocaust. And so, and on top of that, Nazism. So all of this German artwork has been examined to try to understand how Germany got to where it got to. And so a lot of scholars and historians, critics, believe that you could see some antecedents of Nazism in this film, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. And clearly the most obvious one is that it's an outsider who comes into town, who upsets the town and brings its troubles through murder. And so Caligari is seen as an outsider. And of course, when you think outsider, we're thinking of people who do not fit into the privileged class or the dominant class. And so people thought Caligari was an archetype of a Jewish person. Now, here's the thing you need to know. All of that is actually hogwash. Caligari is not a Jewish prototypical character. Of course, academics have biases and they wanted to believe that this was part of the movie because they really do in this beautiful way, want to understand why terrible things happen and be and figuring out why terrible things happen. Maybe we can stop terrible things from happening in the future. So I say it's hogwash and I feel bad about that word, but the issue comes down to this. We're living in this new technological age. In fact, I've always thought of it as a new renaissance. And because we're so better connected, it's possible for us to get in touch with people that we may never have been able to get in touch with before. And so I'm sharing with you a private story about Caligari that will hope, hopefully allow you to see the film in a new way. So besides being a teacher, I'm a performer and I do dance and um, acting and I create films and I actually direct theater pieces and I choreograph, the list goes on. And I got to meet Marcella Ravel, whose husband was Ralph Ravel. The two of them together was, were this brilliant dance team, and they performed all over the Catskills and the Poconos in that heyday of travel into upstate New York and over into Pennsylvania to escape the city. A lot of Jewish people went to these two places. And Marcella, who is now, we're not going to talk about her age. I think that's unfair to do. So I'm, I'm stopping myself from doing that there. So I got to meet Marcella because she got interested in tango. And my husband and I perform tango, have performed tango all over the world. And we became, well, Anton became her instructor, to be honest. And then I would dance with her all the time. And we got into this wonderful conversation about film. And her husband, Ralph, who had passed away several years ago, his father was Rudolf Meinhardt. And what's important about this is Rudolf Meinhardt had his own film company and it got purchased by Decla because Meinhardt 
was a brilliant director and actor and writer. And so he became one of the creative heads at DECLA. And the film he produced was The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. And oftentimes when you look at the credits, these still have not been corrected. They give it to this guy, Eric Palmer. I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying that wrong. I know I am already. Simply because I know who the real guy is. And Eric was liked by the Nazis, was liked by Hitler. And they removed Rudolf Meinert's names from all of his films. And they gave this guy credit for a Jewish man's work. Because what you have to understand is The Camera of Dr. Caligari is a revolutionary film. It was new. It's artistic. You can see the art in it. And so they didn't want to let go of this film. And they could also, probably the Nazis could see it as a very great propaganda tool, right? You have an outside force coming into this small hamlet and upsetting the hamlet. So it definitely plays into Nazi propaganda. But it is not a Nazi film. Because in truth, you or I or anyone can take any piece of art and argue that it does this one thing or that one thing and people will believe it. So hopefully that gives you some insight and gets you thinking about this outsider influence and how people have worked with this film in the past. And now we have this new information that in fact it was produced by a Jewish man who was extremely creative and probably had a very heavy hand in the work. So I want to talk more about Rudolf Meinert because there really isn't a whole lot out there on the web. Marcella Ravel is working very hard to get her father-in-law's name known. And so you're going to see the most tiny little Wikipedia article about Rudolf Meinert. And there's not really many articles. But unfortunately, this is in the real and we can't talk about Rudolf Meinert this whole time, but I'm planting a seed for your own research. I would love to spend some more time talking about Rudolf Meinert, but unfortunately this is in the real, and they're very short videos to help you understand the film you're watching better, or to give you more information to expand your idea of what the films can be. So. Leaving Rudolf Meinert, the next thing that I want to talk about is the title itself, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Most people never think about what this title means. And maybe they think that The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is this box that looks like a coffin that Cesar comes out of. But I think the entire film is a cabinet. And what you have to think about is cabinets of wonder or cabinets of curiosity. Or maybe what you've come across, maybe in your grandmother's house or your mom's house, is they have a curio cabinet. And the cabinet is wood with lots of glass and you can see into it. It displays precious objects. Well, the cabinet of curiosities came into being during the Renaissance when there was this huge move towards learning and collecting. So the cabinet of curiosity blends the sciences and the arts and the collectors would find the most amazing science experiments, tools, art, um, small sculptures, uh, bones, uh, taxidermied animals, the list goes on. And there's kind of these, these eclectic cabinets filled with different objects that would make you wonder, that would push your imagination. And they were definitely seeking exotic things or very expensive things for their cabinets. They were a source of pride, but they were also a source of learning. And so I definitely think that you should do some research into the cabinets of curiosity because there's so much information about them. They started in the Renaissance, but people are still doing them today. And Sometimes, just to give you one more thing that I love, sometimes they weren't just this cabinet. Sometimes people had enough money where they made a whole room that was their cabinet of curiosity. And really, cabinets of curiosity are early museums is a good way to look at them. So with that said, having some background on the cabinet of curiosity, let's take a look at the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Think of the whole movie as this object of wonder. 
And we've you've already probably watched the instructional video so that you know that psychology is on the minds of artists, especially in Austria and in Germany. And so I think the cabinet is not just the movie itself, but it's the inner workings of the characters. And each character is this exotic object to be looked at. And as I look at the movie overall, I see that one monkey at the beginning of the movie in the fair and there are plenty of cabinets of curiosity that had taxidermied monkeys and primates of all kinds. So it seems like a correct choice. Now, of course, you would find a monkey at a fair or carnival, but it just, for me, brings me back to those cabinets of curiosity. So the, the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, it's not a closed film. It doesn't tie off all of the loose ends. It leaves a lot open to interpretation. And I'll be honest with you, without spoiling the, without spoiling the film for you, because with this video, you could actually watch it before you watch the movie. Um, I don't think the ending is that great. I, in fact, think the ending is too rushed. But when I think about the ending, I definitely see some of the conventions of horror in there that have been played out. But what's interesting is we go into Caligari's, let's say, office, and it's filled with all of these objects and books. And it makes me, again, think of these cabinets of curiosity. So I hope this little bit of information helps expand your ideas, get you going into doing some research yourself, and brings you further into the examination of the realness of the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I will see you next week. Bye-bye.